All right, welcome to week two. Um, this week we're going to continue with basic, the basic commands in Linux. Uh, the slideshow tonight is slightly different than the one that's on Brightspace, as in I cut out a couple of slides that were rinse and repeats from last week's. I don't see the point of covering the same material twice inside, you know, seven days. If you don't know what the material is, go look at the last set of slides from last week and you can refresh your memory. Um, or, you know, you can always watch the recording from last week and watch me cover it again. So that's one of the joys of me recording. I don't need to repeat myself. Um, so basically put, I'm going to do a few demonstrations as I go through. Um, what else should you know uh, this week? Uh, lab one, do, you know, ASAP. You should be working on lab two. Uh, the PDF for lab two has been updated. Uh, the prof that created it originally sent me a fixed copy, specifically for uh, question 22. So it's fixed. Uh, I think actually one of the other things I also towards the end of people are complaining about has also been fixed. So that should be uh, somewhat more reasonable. Um, now other than that, yes, uh, it's labs. That's it. There's no assignments in this course. So, you know, this not the announcements get stayed real short. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to dive in for today. If I can get the slideshow to actually move. Okay, so first things first, I'm going to talk about shells a little bit, and I'm actually going to do a few demonstrations that I didn't do last week. The text was so small on the screen that it was no point of even trying. Um, what is a shell? A shell is a command interpreter that executes commands. Um, it provides an interface to a bunch of utilities that you can use. Now, as a Windows user, you don't have a choice of shells. You get what you get, right? You open up a DOS prompt, you open up PowerShell, congratulations, there's your shell. That's it, that's all. Uh, Mac, you have a few more choices, but pretty much everybody uses the built-in terminal. Why? Because it does the job. Um, but the, the actual, once you open up a terminal on Mac, you have the choice of multiple shells once you're in there. Uh, with Linux, the list of shells is as long as your arm. So, it's, you know, lots of stuff. Um, each shell provides a programming language. And they're all a little different. Um, Bash supports, you know, Bash scripting. Or SH scripting. It works. It does a good job. It does what it needs to do. It's cryptic. You'll learn that towards the end of the term, uh, just how special it is. Um, and it allows you to combine the programming language of the shell and any file system utilities together so you can actually write fairly powerful scripts that do lots of stuff. A bit like DOS batch files, when you learned batch files last term, theoretically, you could actually did the lab. Um, except figure that like but on steroids. The amount of stuff you can do compared to DOS is insane. Um, shells can be interactive or non-interactive. Um, interactive mode means you're typing stuff in, stuff happens. And non-interactive is you run a script. Uh, this is repeat from last week, but it was worth discussing it. Uh, these are the two items um, that I wasn't able to show properly on the screen last week, and I'm going to do them now because I now have... extra large font for you guys. Um, so for example, when you list the shells that are installed, it shows you which ones are valid and installed. And Linux, or Ubuntu I should say, by default ships with SH, which is the venerable oldest shell available to any Unix system. A dash, bash, and R bash. Um, we're gonna stick to bash. But there's other shells such as C shell, not like a C shell, C dash cell, um, that serve several purposes. If you want to know what shell you're running, if you go echo dollar sign shell, it tells you what you're currently running, which is going to be bash. Dollar sign shell is an environment variable. If you've had to play with your environment variables in Windows, you know exactly what I'm talking about, like setting your Java home or messing with your path. Those are all environment variables where in Windows you use a nice little GUI to set them. 
in Linux, they're set based on your uh, setup scripts. And the help command shows you all the commands that you can use inside the shell. And, you know, there's a fair amount in there. And most shells offer the help command. They'll show you all the different syntaxes. So, for example, if you're using C shell, the language looks very C-like. Curly's included. As opposed to Bash, which has its own syntax that looks like nothing you've ever seen. All right. These are commands you guys have been doing in lab two. I covered them quickly last week, but I'll cover them again this week. Um, I seem to be missing a slide in there, but I think it was covered last week. Uh, make directory, remove directory. So mkdir makes a directory. rmdir removes a directory. rm nukes a file. Um, and there's a bunch of arguments you can give to rm. However, the two most common ones is dash r and dash f. Dash r means go recursive. In other words, delete everything from here down. And force means do it whether you want it to or not. Um, it's similar to pa passing a, a yes argument to Windows utilities or DOS utilities, such as delete. You can force yes. This one here is dash F as in force. Uh, as long as you have permissions to touch the file, it will go away. So it'll dive recursively, delete directories and everything between here and there. Uh, it's lots of fun. Um, by lots of fun, I mean, no, not really. Because you can do some stupid things. Um, if you really want to experiment, go ahead and run rm-rf slash as root and see what happens. Don't do it while I'm talking. I don't want to console you. Um, but if I go, I'm currently in my home directory. So I've created a directory called Lecture2. I moved into Lecture2. And as you should know, the dash P creates a directory, the whole path of the directory from where you're at. As you can see, I'm using relative paths. I covered the difference between relative and absolute paths last week. Um, so I've got myself a bit of a directory structure here. If I want to nuke a directory, now if I try to do lecture two, it's going to say you're not allowed to do this because there's something inside of it. It's just another empty directory, but it won't let you d get rid of it. Now. You can remove the directory, the whole directory, but you have to specify the entire path of the directory. So if I were going to do now if I fed it all the different arguments, then it'll nuke the whole tree, or theoretically, it'll do it. And as many of you have discovered in lab two, the, the half of the group that's already done it, uh, Linux doesn't tell you you did a good job. It doesn't pat you on the head saying, job well done, you typed in the right command. And if it ran, it just comes back and doesn't say anything. The only time it ever tells you anything is when you did something stupid. Um, so it's entirely possible to do the completely wrong thing and not know you did the wrong thing. Just so you know. So I'm just going to recreate my directories because I'll need them in a minute. All right, passwd, you guys have seen passwd, you need it in lab one when you change the password for root. You change the password using the passwd command. You can tell it which user you want by going passwd space the name of the user. That's pretty much it. It'll prompt you for a new password. Um, you can find out who you are by typing in who am I. I think I covered that one last week uh, because the last command that you see listed in there, SU, allows you to switch between users. Sometimes you actually forget who you are. 
if you're if you're let's say you're you go in as your own user, then you switch users to root, then as root you switch users into somebody else, you may actually forget who you are. And it won't tell you the path of how you became that person either. So it's always important to know who you are when you're messing around with files on the file system. Um, find out what the name of the machine is, as host name, that covered that last week, and uname gives you the operating system. Okay, now these are a few new commands. LS. LS displays the directory content. You can, there's a bunch of options you can use, way more than the three that are listed on here. However, these are the three most common ones you'll want to use. So if I say LS, it gives me everything that's in there. The arguments are as follows. Dash L gives you long listing. What it shows you is a variety of things. It shows you the permissions, uh, the owner, the size of the file, last time the file was touched, and you know what the name of the file is. You may have funny looking things like this. Those are symbolic links. In other words, this points to that. In other words, it's just a pointer to this. So if you were actually going to go, uh, go into that directory, you'd actually be going to this directory. It's kind of cool. Um, ls d shows, well, parent directory, current directory. And dash A says show all. Now, dash A is not very useful in here, so I'm just going to go home for a second and do it again. So if I go ls, it shows me lecture 2. On the other hand, if I go ls dash A, suddenly a bunch of other stuff shows up. Dash A stands for all. Now, specifically, what does that mean? If you look at these files, they all start with a period. And under Windows and Mac, you're used to going and calling something like, you know, lecture1.txt or lecture1.doc. And that's a, a Word document or a text document. And even if you create a file and you just call it dot, dot .doc or dot .text, it's still going to show up. But under Linux, any file that starts with a period is considered to be a hidden file. It's not really hidden because you can do an LA, and I mean an A argument, you'll see it. Whereas in Windows, you have to turn certain flags on to see the hidden files. Um, however, it keeps them out of the regular listing of files so you don't accidentally uh, nuke them. And just so you know, in here, bash history is the history of all the commands you typed in. Bash RC is the basically the initialization script when you log in. So there's a bunch of commands that get run right off the bat. Uh, cache is, well, it's a cache. Uh, profile contains profile information based on uh, your graphical UI. And Vim info is your setting specifically for your install of Vim. Um, now, if I did all three arguments together, so D only gives me directories. And then LA will give me all the files, including the hidden ones, and all their specific properties. Um, CD command. Hopefully you guys know what that is. Change directory. It's just like it is in DOS. It behaves exactly the same way. And those of you that have done lab, you have discovered uh, CD does a bunch of different things, and they all do the exact same thing. For example, all right, so currently I'm in ETC. If I go CD, it takes me home. On the other hand, if I go CD tilde, and that's, you know, above the tab key, shift whatever the heck's above the tab key, it'll give you the tilde, and you have to have a space, it'll still take you home. Why? I don't know. They just decide they, they'd give you more than one way to accomplish the same thing. Uh, tilde does serve a purpose. Go back to ETC again. If I would did
If I did ls tilde slash, it'll show you the contents of everything inside of it. If I did just ls tilde, it'll show you the contents of your home directory. So tilde is shortcut for slash whatever your home directory happens to be. So right now I'm in this root, so it'd be slash root. If you were in as a regular user, it would give you slash home slash whatever your username is. So tilde is shortcut to, to my home. Whereas CD takes you home all the time regardless. All right, PWD. Again, very important command in Linux. It tells you where you are. Or we already showed you a command that tells you who you are. Sometimes it's important to know where you are. And why would that be? Because somewhere along the way, way back in the dark days of the Unix file system, we're talking pre-Linux days here, way pre-Linux days, like 70s kind of days, they felt it was a good idea to call certain directories the same thing all over the place. So, for example, we have a bin directory. So if I PWD that, it'll show you right root bin. Look at that, there's there's a bin directory under the user folder also. Now, the good news is the prompt here is pretty smart and it shows you where you're at. Um, depending on the settings of your shell, this is not always true. Sometimes it'll just show you the current directory, not the entire path. And of course, just to make things extra fun, there's also a bin under user local. Why? Because they could. They all serve different purposes and just over the years it's all gotten modeled what each one's supposed to do. So people just throw shit everywhere they want. I'm exaggerating. There actually is a rule, but for the most part, it's, it's really confusing where things are. Um, oh, look at this. The make directory commands is now showing up after the delete directory command, which we already did. All right. Whoever put these slides together originally really sucked at keeping redundant content out of them. However, the more command is the useful one on this slide. Right, so we got a full screen worth of stuff. Now, this actually allows me to page through it. And if I wanted to, uh, allows you to search through it too, so you can actually list it and search once you learn what the commands are, of course. Um, now, one of the things that may be confusing right now, and you'll actually learn about this a little bit later, is this right here, this character between the ls and the more. That's pipe. And a lot of you have always probably always called it pipe. When you look at your keyboard and you do the, you know, the, the vertical line, it, if you have a, a sane keyboard, it's sitting above your enter key. If you don't have a sane keyboard, take a guess somewhere around your enter key. And if you have a Toshiba laptop, it's in two different places on your keyboard. Take your pick. Uh, not sure where the MSIs have them, but, you know, take uh, your guess is as good as mine because people like moving that key around. Um, but it's known as pipe, and basically what it's, it does is it takes command number one, takes the output for that, and pipes it into program number two. Thus, that's why it's called pipe. It's been called pipe for 40 years because you're piping output from one program to another. So you're funneling the output from one place to another. Okay, man and info I covered last week. All right, copy. You'll notice one thing about Linux commands that after working with DOS and or PowerShell under Windows, that the commands are really short. As in, they remove extraneous vowels, at least all the old ones from back in the Unix days. So CP hasn't changed in 40 years. They've added extra arguments. But 
CP has not changed in 40 years. And it allows you to copy files. Now, what's kind of nifty with O is this is something you can't do under DOS and Windows or PowerShell. Copy file one, file two into a directory. In DOS and or PowerShell, if you want to copy more than one file, you copy the first file, then you copy the second file, or you use a wildcard, copy a batch of files over. The way Linux treats the CP command is CP, everything following that is the list of files to copy until you hit the last one. Whatever is right at the end is your target. So you can list off half a dozen files and copy them home or anywhere else you want. Now, there's a few handy arguments. I. I stands for interactive. In other words, you go copy files and if one already exists with the same name, it's going to ask you, you sure you want to do this? B. It'll make a backup of the destination file. So if you're going to overwrite the file, it'll actually make a copy of it for you. So if you're not confident in what you're doing, you can get it to make backups for you as you go. Definitely not a trick the DOS version of copy can handle. Um, U stands for update. Only copy when the file is newer or the file is missing. So in other words, you want to synchronize one folder to another folder. Copy dash U will copy only the, new, the newer files. And R is recursive. And dash dash parent gives you, well, the parent source path. So it will give you the entire path along for the ride. And I will demonstrate a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to copy two files into lecture two. So I'm going to grab, these are out of VTC, I don't even know what they do. Uh, but I'm going to grab these two things and I'm going to shove them into here. And blink, so if I did, there's my two files that I copied. Now, if I were to add a couple of arguments to this. Interactive, backup. And I hit enter. It's going to ask you, do you want to overwrite this file? Sure. Do I want to overwrite that file? No. And as you can tell, as you can see, it doesn't tell you whether or not it's whether or not it succeeded. It only tells you when it fails. So it just, you know, much like students, they don't complain when they succeed, and they complain when they fail. Now, here's a bit of the results of the output. You have MailCap, which I said, yes, overwrite, and it created a copy of MailCap and threw on a tilde at the end of it. So that's to show that it's a backup. I said no to mTools. Therefore, <coughs> it didn't overwrite it or create a backup because it didn't get overwritten. <coughs> when it backs things up, it only backs them up when you actually overwrite the files. All right. So this is similar to the last command on that slide. So I'm going to copy the etc directory the file passwd that's in etc, I'm going to shove it in my lecture folder. Now what this is supposed to do, it's supposed to copy the directory structure above, above it. So if I do this, you'll notice that the etc directory was created in here. So that means it copies the, the, the entire path of the file for the ride. So even if the file is five directories deep, it'll create the entire directory structure that belongs to it, right to the root. It's handy if you're trying to mess along around with a lot of settings and you want to mi mimic the same directory structure as what's there. 
or maybe you are keeping certain directories in sync and you want to make sure that any parent directories get created along for the ride. Um, some really handy tools. All right, so the next one after copy is move. Move is MV. Why? Because vowels are a waste of time. I guess the only thought I have is why they chose to do this years ago. Well, actually, it used to be that Unix was designed to be quick to type. Therefore, they reduces the commands as small as they could. Um, move does exactly what you think it does. It moves a file or a directory to one place to another. And as always, it has I, B, and U. Also has R for recursive. It'll move I's for interactive, as in do you want to overwrite what's there? B is to back it up. U is um oh, I forget what the hell is U again. Update. There we go. So those are common ones, and then there's R for recursive. Now there's one thing people don't realize in DOS and or Windows Command Prompt and PowerShell, if you want to rename a file, we have a command called rename. Ren, actually. In Linux, we don't have that. How do you rename a file? You move it. As you can see, I'm not actually moving the file anywhere. I'm just going to say, take that file that's there and name it that instead. And I go boop, and no such thing. Oh, because I'm not in the right place. That could have been bad if I chose to actually do it with a, with a file that wasn't a backup file. Uh, once again, it gave me an error because I was doing something stupid in the wrong place. Um, so th that I did, I did the move. So if I do an ls in here, you'll see that m mail cap tilde is gone because it's been replaced by old. So I moved the file. That's how you rename them. It's a little weird, but it works. And if I were to go, so I want to move the old back to the new. And I want to make a backup and make sure it prompts me. Therefore, there you go. Yes, I want to overwrite it. So now if I do an LS, I'm starting to have all kinds of copies. But not quite. But basically put mailcap.old is gone because I moved it to overwrite mailcap. So as we're moving files around, they're getting deleted, moved, renamed. All right. The next one is cat. Um, what does cat stand for? I don't remember. I think it stands for catalog. Cat is nifty. You want to see the contents of a file. Um, under Windows, you don't have a whole lot of choices. It's called type, actually, the command under Windows to do the same thing. And is that the one? Oh, no, we're using FS tab. Okay, let's go with FS tab. Okay, so I catted FS tab. Actually, let me clear my screen so it's more obvious what just happened. Okay, catted FS tab. FS tab is the file system system tab, and it basically it tells Linux what file systems to load and what hard drives to mount. Um, but that's the contents of the file. Basically, put everything under the command is what's inside that file. That's what's in there. If I were to do the same thing with no contents are there. Now what's fun is you can go cat the contents and then more it. So you can actually take the time to actually see what's inside. And you can also concatenate files. Um, so if I were to cat something, It'll take one file, output the contents, and then output the second file together as one file. It looks like one file when you're done. So then you can redirect that output into a new file. It's a useful tool if you've got a lot of log files that you need to consolidate. As in, anybody here ever run their own web server? 
or God help me, look at the log files on your Minecraft server. Okay, that, see, I get a reaction from that one. So I say web server, they go, no, Minecraft server, oh yeah, done that. Right? And odds are your Minecraft server has log files, right? That tells you what's going on, what's not working, who's connecting, that kind of crap. And most programs of that nature have multiple log files, access logs, error logs, that kind of stuff. You can use cat to take all those log files and consolidate them as a single file, so then you can surf through it and parse content. So if you're looking for a constant IP address that's constantly hammering your system, you can actually cap the two files together, so then you can only search through one. You only need to do one search to see how often they hit you, uh, they hit you up. Okay, the next one is the touch command. Touch command allows you to create a new file. Right? Now, that's real mature, I know. But, you know, I touched butt and now the butt exists. I confirm that butt exists by touching it. Right? I could go like this, which is like what 90% of the guys in here have never done. Right? I'm picking on the guys. Just, you know. Can't go the other way, so I've got to pick on the guys, right? It's, it's not sexist when you pick on the guys. So, you know, and now in here, I got a butt and a girl. We're having a good time. You'll never forget the touch command ever. <laughs> After my examples. Uh, now, why would you want these files? It's a, an empty file. Basically, it's a placeholder. There's nothing inside of it. However, sometimes you want to launch a process and you want to make sure another process can't take over. I, those of you that I helped do it with your apt commands where the apt command wouldn't work because there's a file that was existing, a lock file, complaining about something was locked. Essentially, the apt update service was creating a file called lock by touching lock. As long as lock exists, it wouldn't let anybody else it run. So when you touch a file, you can use it to create a file that ex that's already there to guarantee that the process started. And then when the process ends, you can nuke the file. And if the file doesn't get nuked, that means the process never ended properly. So you can touch things to make sure they exist. Now, touch has one other job. You can touch existing things also. Now, as you look here, I touched butt at 5.30, touched the girl at 5.34. Yes, I know, we're having a good laugh. And this is going on YouTube, this is the best part, you know. I'm shameless. However, if I go to touch butt again, suddenly butt's timestamp has updated. I touched my butt more recently than I touched the girl. Hey, and there's all kinds of things in here you can do, right? Now, but that's what touch does. So the other trick with touch is you can use touch to update timestamps on files. So let's say you have a file that you, when your process started and you touch the file, it creates the file, sets a timestamp. Partway through the process, you could touch the file a second time and update its timestamp. Or you could just use it to randomly touch a file so you know when certain things are running. So, oh, this last command was run at this date because that file's timestamp was that. All right, another handy command after touching, because we're done touching things for now, is the tree command. Tree is not installed by default on Linux, or at least not installed by default on Ubuntu. And it's too bad because it's actually a really handy command, especially if you go to try to do lab two and it asks you how many directories are left and those kinds of things. Tree actually gives you a graphical representation of your tree structure from your current position. And as usual, I'll do tree, but I'll add the argument dash a. So that includes all files and all directories, including hidden directories. Ah, crap, that's the option for that.
There we go. L says, how many levels down do you want to go? So current level plus what's inside of this directory? It's two levels down. Crap. And D only gives you the directories. So if you, you know, for example, right now if I'm going tree A, it shows everything in there. If I just did D, it just shows me the directory structure. It's a great way to count how many directories are left. One, two, three, four. Because we have four directories that are left. And you can combine them adding all files. And I could say only too deep. So you can combine all these arguments to your heart's content. Now the only thing that's going to be weird here is the L space 2 means too deep. At that point if you want to add more arguments you're going to have to add another dash after the 2. And of course as always you can tell it what tree you want to list. So I just did the etc directory. And if you're curious about how big that directory is, we can get rid of the L argument. And it'll just keep going forever. Because etc is a really big directory with lots and lots of files. And you really shouldn't play in there unless you have to. That's where all the settings for your system are in. OK. Now this is where things get a little wonky. And this is the kind of stuff you really want to remember for tests and exams. Just putting that out there. Output redirection. This you could do in DOS and PowerShell also. Take a command, redirect to a file. So the greater than symbol redirects output to a file. Fantastic. But it overwrites. So if I go home and I go So I've shown you guys tree, which is cool. I'm going to tell it give me all directories, but I'm going to redirect to a file called tree list. So when I do this, nothing. However, I can look at the contents of tree list and there's my con my content. So I took the output of the command, instead of being displayed in the shell, it actually writes it to a file. Some of you might be saying, well, what's useful about that? <laughs> Lots. Um, in your second level database course, have you guys installed MySQL yet? No? OK. Um, when you back up files using MySQL, you have to tell it where to put the content. How do you tell it where to put the content? But by running something that looks like this. MySQL dump space database name pipe. What's the output file called? That's just how MySQL works. So it'll take the entire contents of your database, convert it into SQL, and write it into a file. So then you can parse through the file and actually look at the contents of your database. It'll give you all your table create statements, all your insert statements, all that jazz. Now, if I use double greater than, allows you to append. In other words, it'll leave the file alone and just keep adding stuff to it. So currently, my file has just that little bit. If I were to go and say, I want to include the directory structure for ETC and throw it into this file, and I want to append to it, I'll do that. Now I'm going to just more that file because it's a lot bigger now. You can see at the top there, that there's the first part from my home directory, and it says five directories. And then you'll see etc, and here's the contents of etc. 340 directories inside etc. So that's double pipe. I mean, um, double greater than. 
there's a few flags you can set up in your in your on your machine, and there's something called no clobber. No clobber is a really handy um, command. So when you set up no clobber, that means you can't overwrite a file that already exists. So th this one here requires a bit more typing, so I'm going to sit down. So there's a command called set. Set lets you change bash file built-in rules. And minus C. Now minus C means, because by default, bash lets you clobber files as an overwrite file. So this is saying set to negative clobber, as in no clobber. They're clever. They tried to be. So now if I were to try to do this, It's going to say, hey, you're not allowed to do that. It already exists because I set the no clobber rule to on. So if I were to turn, where did that go? Cool. Doesn't remember the set command. Is it plus, yeah, it's plus C. Now if I were to do the exact same thing after turning clobbering back on, whoop, it lets me do it. So clobber is handy when you're working locally if you don't want to accidentally, excuse me, nuke files by redirecting output. It's totally possible you could by accident overwrite files and because you weren't paying attention and you're just using one the single redirect, not double redirect. Um, I just did the example so you can see that. Um, pipe, you've seen me use pipe a few times already. And it allows you to connect two commands. It takes the output of the first command, feeds it into the second command. And then you can pipe half a dozen programs together. You could pipe an ls, feed it into a grep, then feed it into a move command. Uh, grep I teach later. Um, grep basically lets you search the contents of files. Now, you can change your user prompt. I remember when I first started learning Unix. Notice I didn't say Linux, I said Unix. Because that's what we learned while we were in school was Unix. Uh, changing our command prompt was the coolest thing ever because I have no idea. We were really sad. I mean, didn't take much to excite us back then. Nowadays, you know, it's a little more complex. So there's a bunch of arguments you can use. And D is the current directory. Hang on here. Let me let me pull up what the list is. My mouse has died. There you go. Okay. So Oh, that's so small. Let's make it bigger. All right. So here are the choices. D will give you the date. H is the host name. And the capital H is the full host name, so you always know where you're logged into. Um, terminal slave. Time. Use your username. W is your working directory. And capital W is the working, base working directory. Uh, versioning. And you can actually have extra characters in there, such as your new line and stuff. So I could actually set my prompt to look like this. Let's see what they give me here. So let's say I just want my prompt to be backslash u. Look at this. Here's my prompt now. It's starting to get a little harder to read because there's no dividers, there's none of that. But I can change it to and now we're back to the original prompt we had which is what's my user, what's my host name, colon, what's my current path, 
Uh, I could change this to be the full host name, which in this case, that's the same thing. That's because it's so useful. Uh, if I want to, I could stick on the date, which is not very useful without at least a space. So now my prompt contains when is it all the time. Or if you're really worried about what you're in the middle of doing while you're in class and you know you got a hot date, You can get it to tell you the time all the time. So as I move through, you can see the timestamps updating as I go, so you always know when it is. We thought it was cool back in the day. Nowadays, you know, it's a little lame, but, you know, it's handy. Um, then there's a secondary prompt. When you uh, don't, don't complete a command in the first line, so if I were to go... So backslash tells it to, to ignore the carriage return. I'm escaping the carriage return, so now I'm on my second line. And you can see I've got a little greater than symbol. That's not saying it's a pipe or a redirect. That's just saying, you know, I'm going to finish my commands from here. Now it's going to complete it. You can change that secondary prompt as in you can make it, you know, say anything you want. So now it says continued. Until it's done. So you can change that prompt. Put it back to default because it gets a little weird when you start changing things. All right. Here's another nifty one. Word count. Because there once was a time where, you know, Counting words is a pain in the ass. Um, we didn't have word to tell us how many words we have. By the way, word lies. Just so you know. The number of words it tells you is not always the number of words in your document. It's It counts so many characters as a word. So, yeah. On the other hand, if I do word count tree list, it shows... A bunch of numbers. And so essentially it shows you how many new lines, words, and byte counts for each file. So 343 new lines. That, By the way, that's a carriage return and enter key. 976 words for a total 9,260 9, bytes. So that's the contents. So if you just want to know how many bytes in the file? There you go. That's how many there is. Um, you can also tell it how many, literally just how many words are inside the file, 976 words, which is nifty. Or you can tell it, I just want the words and the lines, but not the number of carriage returns, uh, number of bytes. It's kind of nifty. All right. So when you can list the contents of a text file, there's a bunch of commands. There's tail. It shows you the last 10 lines of the file. You can actually pass an argument that shows you more than the last 10 lines. Head does the first 10 lines of a file. So if I were to play with my tree list again, I go tail tree list. It shows me the last, last 10 lines. If I said head tree list shows you the first 10 lines. More displays text files page by page. Less is more, as in less is more, literally. Less does the exact same thing as more. It's a pun. It's a bad one, but less is more. Uh, cat displays the contents of the file. I showed you guys all already. And then you got tack. And somebody here tried to be clever. It shows you the contents of the file in reverse order. Last line first. So if I were to go, so we do cat 
tree list. There's our tree list. If I go tac, tree list, there's the file in reverse order. Just getting clever and cute. Um, now I'm going to get around to cut. Does it just? Yeah, okay. I wanted to double check something before I kept going. Um, later on, I'm going to show you guys some nifty tricks with uh, tail uh, when we start doing searches inside of files. Now, the cut command is kind of cool. Cut allows you to take text out of a file and display it to the screen or to another file. But the cool part about it is you can tell it to, <coughs> to delimit the contents and actually treat it as a CSV file. You guys know what a CSV file is? Hopefully you remember that kind of from database. Comma separated value file? No. Okay, you're going to learn it eventually in, in one of your database courses. Um, basically, a CSV file is a file that's using characters to separate different values. Uh, depending on the file, so the file type, it'll use colons, commas, tabs. So often you'll, you can export an Excel spreadsheet as a comma separated file. Now, if I were to cat pass WD, uh, I have to be in the right place first. So here's my password file. Password file doesn't actually contain passwords. There once was a time it contained passwords, but now it doesn't. Um, it was a little too obvious having a password file that contained passwords. Um, but you'll see in here that a bunch of colons. This is colon delimited. So what you can do with cut is you can say, based on this delimiter, give me the following field. So I want to delimit by colon and give me the first field in pass WD, which now gives me just the usernames in pass WD. If I were to tell it give me field number five, it gives me the nice names of the usernames. So I could go and it'll show me the username and the nice name for each person or user in the system. As you can see, not all users have a nice name. And some of them, the name is the same as their username. As you can see, these are some of the older type users in here. Root, Daemon, Bin, Sys, Sync, Games. Yes, Games. There was a user called Games. Uh, man, LPs for printing, that kind of stuff. So cut is cool because you can actually grab specific parts. And then you can paste. What's the point of custom cutting if you can't paste? Um, so pasting takes files from contents from file one and file two creates another file that contains them without ever modifying the original two files. So it's a bit like when you do cat, file one, file two, except what this does is it takes every row of file one, puts it on beside it for file two. So let me go and demonstrate that a little bit. So if I were to go And if I go, here's what it gives me. It takes the contents of file one and file two. So it takes line one of file one and takes line of one of file two and puts them side by side. Um, so there's a few cute tr things you can do. That. You can use a delimiter um, and zero terminated, which is a little dangerous. But if I were to go, Now I've got myself a common delimited file. So now I'm creating myself a CSV file ready for import into a database. 
It's a cute trick. It's useful. Uh, especially if you're trying to take contents of directory structures and whatnot and you need to, or you want to take um, only file names and their size and you want to collect them together. Uh, those are things you can do. Now, for all of you who are um, suffering from, holy shit, I don't remember what the command was I just ran three steps ago. You can type in, and it shows you every command you've run since day one. All the way back. Kind of handy, kind of useful. But what's really cute is, um, so the bash history has, is the default file, well it's called, but you can actually set an environment variable called um, hist file, and you can change what it's called. Um, hist size is an environment variable that says how many commands it'll remember. So it'll remember the last thousand commands you ran. Which, theoretically, for this course would probably be enough to keep track of all your commands you're going to run on your command prompt since the beginning. Yes? I don't know. Let's find out. That's the answer. No, it won't be there because it never worked successfully. So the good news is it'll remember all the commands you did right. So it's a really good way of filtering out the crap that you, all the, you know, those 26 attempts you made at trying to create a directory? Not you personally, but I'm just saying in general. It'll clear those out. Um, and the fact that I ran history, if I run the same command last, it doesn't actually update the file. So if I did this and then I do this, you'll see that history gets duplicated. So history only keeps the last unique command you ran. So if you run the same command over and over and over again, it's not going to keep adding it to history because it's the last thing you did. Now, there's the bang command. Exclamation mark. Bang is cool. Because let's just say you know in your history you ran a command such as command 147 right here. Where I actually now let's do 149 because that was was more interesting. 149. I can go bang 149, and I'm in the wrong place. And it'll run the command, so you don't have to retype the whole command if you can find it in your history. As long as you can find the entry number you did, so history shows the the number that you did, then I can go exclamation mark and a number and it'll actually rerun that command. So if you did run a really cool command that you really want to remember, then you don't want to, you know, and you're actually s not as useful when you have Windows terminals where you can copy paste, but picture back in the day where you were working on a dumb terminal where you didn't have a mouse, copy pasting wasn't a thing. So how would you get your old commands to, we don't have to type in the big long command again. You'd run history, and then you'd go bang whatever the command number was. It's kind of useful. Um, and you can use a negative, which is negative four, which means um, basically put, what was the last command I ran four commands ago? So if I go back home, in here, and I go history, just one more time, just see what's in here, and I want to run uh, 154, so 65 minus 54 is 11. And I hit the man file. And as you can see, it doesn't actually remember 12. There we go. Apparently, I don't know how to count. Um, as you can, if I hit the up key, as you can see, it doesn't, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It doesn't bring up the bang command minus 12 again. It actually brings the command that was run instead. So it actually substitutes 
you know, bang minus 12 with paste dash D. And let's say you want to redo the last thing you did. You don't want to type the whole thing and go double bang. But honestly, so for those of you who have been wondering how I'm pulling these commands back up so fast, it's the up key. And what's cool is you're going to go up and down. Um, which leads me to the last shortcut key that you might want to know since I've, you've been watching me. If those of you are wondering how I'm doing the autocomplete, the tab key. So you just start typing. Hit the tab key. And if, you hit, if it doesn't find the command you're after or the directory you're after, and you hit the tab twice, it'll show you all the matching parameters. So I could go... And there's, you know, auto-completing. Uh, you can get it to auto-complete commands, too. Although, you know, depending on what command you're trying to run, uh, you may have some mixed mileage, as you can see. But it's a great way to find what commands you have available with the search of that letter. Now, there's a few other commands that are useful. There is the which command. Um, it shows the full path name of the commands which would be executed in your current environment. Now, under Windows, you have full, you have your path variables, right? Uh, you may or may not actually know they exist, but it exists. And the path is the execution path. In other words, it searches through all the directories listed in the path to find what you want to run. Linux does the same thing, uh, but what what Linux has, but Windows does not have, is I can go. I can go which ls, and it'll tell. tell if I were to run the command ls, it'll tell me it's going to run that version of ls. Um, sometimes there are cases where the same command exists in more than one place, depending on uh, different versions of the same application being installed. So in theory, you could install two versions of VI. And I, then you tell it, which one am I actually going to run every time I type in VI? It'll tell you. Um, and then dash A shows all matches, which is, you know, LS only has the one. Um, again, CP is only the one, so that shows the, ex the matching example. Okay, where is... Where is is um, it's almost the same thing as which. Uh, it tells you which one is going to run. Where is shows you all the places things can. Um, so I asked for where is ls. It shows me ls exists in the bin in bin directory. I mean. And there's also an ls file in man. So anyth basically anything that starts with ls will work. If I do the same thing with cp, there's the cp or cat. So where there's all the places cat's found. Um, you can tell it I just want to find the binaries, also known as programs or utilities. In other words, things you can execute. Because sometimes you don't care that you know, there's a dozen things called the same thing all over the file system or where the man files are. You just care where the executables are. So you want to know which versions the executables are running. And you can do that. There's only the man files. S only searches for source code. Uh, once was a time where if you wanted to install a new, a new program on your computer in Linux or Unix, you downloaded the source code. You went into the source code's directory and you go make. Then you waited an hour, and then you had a program that may or may not work. Or it might fail after 45 minutes because it's missing a library. You never know. You guys are really lucky nowadays where you just install. Wasn't that, it wasn't always a good time. Um, aliases. 
not like aliases and databases. Just putting it out there. R similar idea, but not the same. Aliases allow you to define your own commands. So let's just say you use ls-la a lot. You can actually alias it to, to always have it. So you could go And I'm going to make sure I actually type that in right. So right now, I create an alias. And if I now typed in my ls, it's the same thing as typing. Really, this is not actually saving me much typing, saving me one character of typing. But if I were to use a series of really complex commands on a regular basis, as in I want to try to trace the output going into a log file for a web server, I could actually put that all as one command and then just run a short command as in log check. And it's handy that way. And if I type in just the word alias, it shows me all uh, the aliases that are currently defined. Um, a couple of aliases for grep. Um, alias L is ls-lf, cf, I mean. So if I go L, it shows me that. If I go la, it shows me different options. LL shows me all files low, long format, cute trick. And then I got my ls at the end. Um, and then you can unalias. When you unalias, you delete an alias. And now my ls is gone. Um, aliases are handy if you want to stop remembering command line arguments. I don't recommend you start setting aliases for all the commands you're going to use in this course because if you don't remember memorize them tests may not be so fun so you want might start one of memorizing a command line arguments um, that's pretty much what this course is about okay and now this lecture is actually fairly short because it's an info dump it really is um, as I did, as I demonstrated pretty much every command I covered today. There's not a lot to them. Um, but this is everything you need for lab uh, two and lab three, if I remember right. Um, does anybody have any questions? I mean, obviously, if I'm doing something and you're not sure what I'm doing, feel free to interrupt me. Anybody who's ever had me as a student knows I don't mind interruptions. You know. I know, it's self-explanatory. Um, there's not a lot of concepts to understand here because except it's commands you've got to play with. All right, so um, as you can tell, these lectures are going to be fairly short. So we're going to call it here. Uh, in a minute, I'll stop recording. Um, I don't know if the lab class is open yet or not, but if it is, those that have lab tonight can actually probably run up there and we can actually get through lab even earlier. So we can all go home earlier. Uh, let's cross our fingers and hope. If not, we can always sit in that student lounge area and do it. <laughs> you, you laugh. I've done that before. Um, and I need to get to here and go.